Welcome to the show, Robin. Very excited to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Now, the reason that you're here is because we have a lovely lady in common, which is Primalista Rosie. Now, Primalista Rosie is based in Perth, and she told me about her amazing sister who lives in London, who does incredible things. And so I had to get you on the show to, to have a chat to you. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm super excited about what she's been doing. And um, of course, that's because of you and, and what you've created. So we're all a big love fest, really, <laughs> with each other. <laughs> Everywhere. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So before we get into all about Robin and your story, tell us what you had for breakfast. So this morning I had a great, so just to give you some background information, it's currently 6.39 a.m. So this morning I had a green smoothie um, because I, I make them up in batches of 40 and I have them in the freezer. Um, so that it, because I've got two little kids, I've got a one and a half year old and a two and a half year old. So I need to have something in the freezer at all times that is nutrient dense and ready to go. So I, I make them up in huge batches once a month or so and, and then I can use them throughout the month for breakfast on the go or um, snacks if I need it. So they've got tons of greens, things like bok choy, things like um, uh, chicory and then ginger and mint and basil and a bit of pear and a date and some papaya and all kinds of things. It's, you know, lots of ingredients in there. So that's what I had this morning. But I often have soup for breakfast, actually. That's one of my favorite things. I prefer to have veggies and, you know, something like a chicken soup is easy to batch prepare. and the kids actually love it as well so i'm loving this batch i'm loving this batching idea because you're a very successful businesswoman and you're a very successful mother so it's 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 the batching and doing little things like this isn't it that make um make it a lot easier so that you're going to be nourishing yourself to be able to deal with all of the shiz that will come your way in your busy life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think, I, you know, they say that if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Um, so, you know, I had to teach myself how to cook. It's been a process over the last decade. Um, and once I had kids, the framework of that changed entirely. And again, so when I was four, so my first pregnancy went to 42 weeks yeah. and at 41 weeks, I just, I, I, I gave a lecture on my due date, right? I stood up and, and spoke to 200 people about um, traumatic brain injury on my, literally on my 40 week due date. And because I, I knew it would go to 42 weeks, but anyway, 41 weeks, once I'd finally finished work and relaxed and everything, I just thought, like with my big belly and everything suddenly decided that no, I was going to prepare a month's worth of, worth of meals and smoothies and lactation smoothies. So I ordered a, <laughs> Cause you're kind of crazy when you're pregnant. Mm. So I ordered a chest freezer and did a menu plan. And then um, literally me and my big belly spent two days chopping and preparing and cooking and, you know, making all these freezing meals. But honestly that, so that first month postpartum was so easy because all of my meals were done for, again, it was 40 days. It's easy to prepare things in batches of four, <laughs> so mm. 40 days. And, and because that was such a good experience, I kept doing that. So I started doing once a month meals, which is a whole website in the States. And um, I didn't actually use their website, but I took their ideas and, and some of the recipes and I did Whole30 and, you know, lactation stuff. And, and once a month, I would have one massive cooking day and um and prepare and it, i can't do once a month anymore that's to spend a whole day cooking i don't have time for that anymore but that's when i really started batch preparing because you spend half a day or a couple of hours and then the rest of your week is a breeze so it totally you know i have to budget in the time to do that batch prepare but it changes everything about my entire week or my entire month and it makes it super easy to grab something that i want to eat instead of and that will make me feel good afterwards and tomorrow instead of eating something because I'm hungry and I haven't prepared and it's you know going to make me feel tired or you know irritable later on that's amazing so it's, a, it's really yeah. we, we could do a whole hour on batch cooking but um we won't but just before we move on before we move on from that <laughs> but with your smoothies are you just freezing the uh like the leaves and everything you're not like whizzing them up and then freezing them 
smoothie. Yeah, I freeze all the ingredients. Yeah, but I freeze everything. So if I'm going to put L-glutamine in there, if I'm going to put any protein powder, if I'm going to put probiotics, it all goes in the bag. So all the leaves go in there. I chop, so chop the fruits. Um, chop things into small pieces, I don't, you know, um, because when you're blending from frozen, you have to make it a bit easier for the blender to work. Otherwise, you blow out the engine. So chop everything, throw all the leaves in, throw any powders in. The only thing then when I'm whizzing it up to have for breakfast is I add a liquid, which is usually water, but sometimes I use tea, like a robust tea or something like that. Mm. Wow. Sounds amazing. And then for the meals that you make, are you like doing big cookups, like things like chili con carne and things like that, that you can put into little containers in the freezer? I do do that. Um, so I do ragu a lot, you know, like a bolognese kind of thing. I do soups and uh, green curries and chili a lot, you know, that kind of thing. But actually, so I've, I've got an intern who's been working with me for the last month and having somebody in the house, like, observing what I actually do she said to me one of the things that she's noticed that I do is I prepare ingredients like I batch prepare ingredients mm. rather than meals so that I can throw things together um at a little bit ad hoc but I've got all the things that I need there to do that so I you know I roast chicken and then I've got um some chicken in the fridge and some chicken in the freezer um I roast veggies and so I'll have veggies in the freezer and veggies in the fridge and then if I want to I can make a salad I can make a casserole I can make a hot dish a cold dish and I didn't even really understood understand that I did that it was sort of an automatic thing she pointed out to me that I I so I batch prepare meals but I also batch prepare ingredients mm. um that I can throw things together. Yeah. It's super smart. It's super smart. I, lo I do the same and I, I love to be able to just go to the fridge and like have like a, I call it scraps of the fridge. It's not, there's no scraps yeah. at all. It's all amazing food, isn't it? But it's scraps <laughs> yeah. of the fridge. It's like, right, what yeah. can I have? And it's like, you maybe start off with like a, a base of a salad and then you can throw in some beetroot salad and a coleslaw and some leftover chicken and some leftover guacamole and a blob of sour cream and spring colour cheese. Exactly. And it's just incredible, yeah. like butter bowl, as they're called now. Scraps yeah. It, exactly. I call it scraps of the fruit, <laughs> but it's more marketable. As Instagram a calls it Buddha bowl. Right? <laughs> yeah, scraps of exactly. The fruit. That's how I, that's how I eat most of the time. Is that uh, conglomeration meal? Yeah, conglomerate. just realised that. Yeah. Are you getting blind? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because the um, the light comes up in front of me. So I've got the blinds down, but they're open, so I'm stripy on your on your camera. But do I you want to adjust them? No, you can adjust them. We don't want you to get blinded. For those of us watching on YouTube, you'll know what's going on. If you're listening to the audio, like what are they on about? But it's sunrise in England. Well, actually, it's not sunrise because yeah. the sun rises at like three a.m. or something ridiculous this yeah, time. Yeah, pretty early at time of year. We don't have a lot of. Hang on. So if I pull the blinds up. And I won't be stripy and I can just sit so it's not in my eyes. Can you see it properly? Yeah, yeah. But you yeah, just, now you've got like diamond shapes on your face. That, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, from the lead lighting on the window. Oh, like, <laughs> oh, lead lighting, not security. <laughs> oh, so, so nice, so nice. Anyway, yeah. right. So I'm rambling now, but let's get into Robin and your story. How did you sure. tell us about your background and how you became to be so passionate about functional medicine? So I was, a, I was a beauty therapist originally and I went from beauty therapy into medical aesthetics. And so medical aesthetics was working with lasers and chemical peeling and um, working in a medical practice. Uh, and I was bored, actually, is the actual story. So I'd been doing that for eight years and I was super bored. I loved the job because it was connecting with people and having them tell me their stories and, you know, being alone in a room with a woman for two hours, you have to talk about some stuff and women connect. And it, I was able to ask really probing personal questions. So I loved that aspect of it, but I didn't have to turn my brain on apart from that. It was all heart centered. So in my spare time at home after work, et cetera, I would read anything and everything. I've always been a voracious reader, but I picked up this book called The Molecules of Emotion. And it was written by a biochemist and it was all about how the, it was actually all about the communication systems in the body, how your immune system communicates, how your brain communicates to your body and vice versa. And um, it just, you know, it piqued this interest in me about the immune system specifically about how the brain works, et cetera. And then um, 
fast forward six months and I uh, started doing a bit of research around how the ingredients that I was using work. Like how does retinol work? What does it actually do to the cell? And um, why do we use L-ascorbic acid? And how, does, how is vitamin C involved in collagen production? And so as I was researching that, I read an article written by a nutritionist here in the UK and uh, he had a book. So then I read his book and at the end of the book, it says, well, I started this college. So then I enrolled at the college. And so it was a snowball, you know, yeah. starting with a little article that I read on Google. And um, yeah, so then that, so I studied at the college for four years and I went into it thinking that it would be a natural extension of what I was doing for work, mm -hmm. that people who have problems with their skin have problems with their gut. So I would help people. Um, to fix their gut and to calm down their inflammation and it would I would just continue on with my job But it would be more extensive and more interesting for me Therefore what I discovered is that people who have problems with their skin want a quick fix as a general yes. They're not usually especially in a medical practice. They want a cream or a peel or a treatment They don't actually want to do the hard work around not eating dairy anymore or whatever it is and also during the course of you know of college I discovered that actually I love a lot of other things more than the skin like the skin is really interesting to me and it was my gateway drug so to speak into the whole industry but I really loved the brain and I really loved the immune system the immune system comes alive for me you know I'm like all of the immune cells have their own little personalities and um, you know it's very um, visual you know when I'm reading around the immune system so but you know it was interesting and I every second week had a new, okay, I'm going to do this when I qualify, I'm going to do this when I graduate, etc. But um, what actually happened was in my last year of, so let me preface that. So I moved to the UK in early 2014 and I had actually been sick for about 19 years at that point. Um, so... Uh, with a bunch of different things. I had my, I suffered from migraines. I had constant chest infections and sinus infections and fatigue and I was super underweight and um, I had ex like suffered really badly with eczema my entire life, like whole legs and whole arms and hands and feet and on my forehead. Okay, now I'm, that I'm super, <laughs> such a weird, I'll sit over here. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I had all of these symptoms and, but nobody had ever asked why I was having all of these problems. And, you know, none of the doctors that I saw at that time, um, you know, did anything except prescribe, you know, prescribe a drug for this and a steroid cream for the eczema and nobody ever joined the dots. So eventually I got so sick, I actually thought that I had cancer. I was very convinced. I was so tired that I couldn't even speak anymore. And I'm pretty verbose. So that was a, that was a big change. I was really underweight. You know, I looked ill and the, you know, in Perth, there's a, this women's, I don't even know if it's there anymore, but there was a women's health center and there was a big long waiting list to get in there. It was NHS. It was a GP, not NHS. What was it called? Medicare. So yeah. um, it was a, G, a GP. But there was this long waiting list and they only, they only had women doctors working there. They only dealt with women, women's problems. So I think they were more dealing with issues around pregnancy and domestic abuse and stuff like that. But I decided that was where I was going to go. And there was a British GP who was working there. And I walked in and I had prepared for this doctor's appointment. And I'd written down every symptom and everything that I thought was relevant in my medical history. And she picked out two things, which were I had fatigue and that I had noticed that if I reduced wheat, the eczema got better. And she said, I'm going to test you for celiac disease. And when she said that, I immediately knew that that's what it was. Like, I just knew. She said it, something clicked into place. And I was like, okay, here we go. We've got an answer. The blood test came back positive. I went and had a biopsy that was positive. So I had total villus atrophy. I had a diagnosis of celiac disease. And during that time, between the doctor's appointment where I had the blood test and the biopsy, I got offered a job in London. So I got the biopsy back. Like two weeks later, I flew to London. So I ate everything I could get my hands on, all the pizza and fish and chips that I could <laughs> consume for that two weeks. I ordered a gluten-free meal on the plane. And so when I got on the plane, that was kind of the delineation of mm. the, my gluten-free life. So when I came to London, I was gluten-free from here on in. 
but when I went gluten-free, migraines went away, eczema went away, fatigue went away, like big miraculous recovery. I, you know, put on a bit of weight, everything started working properly, more or less. And I didn't think about it particularly anymore. So by the time I went to nutrition school, that wasn't any part of my motivation. Um, and it wasn't really that much a part of what I was motivated around studying. Like I felt like my health was okay. Um, and I was managing it fine. And then in the last year of, of college, I got gluten really badly and didn't recover. So usually my symptoms on getting gluten would be uh, predictable and um, kind of linear. You know, they would follow a set pattern and they would last between two and four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd be tired for a couple more weeks after that and then I'd be fine again. So at six months of being sick, of not being able to get out of bed and, mm -hmm. and essentially had chronic fatigue syndrome, um, realised, and I, at, at that point, been seeing other nutritionists. I'm going to sneeze. I'd been seeing uh, doctors. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I'd been seeing doctors who, who stylized themselves as being functional medicine doctors or alternative medicine sort of compliant doctors or um, compatible doctors and nobody had been able to actually help me to understand why I was sick, why I hadn't recovered from this getting glutened. And what I realized in that moment was I knew nothing about celiac disease, particularly outside of it damages your gut. It's, it's a gluten reactive autoimmunity, the villi, et cetera, et cetera. So, and not only did I not know about this disease that I had, but the doctors and the nutritionists, here in the UK at that time also didn't know anything about it. But I had been listening to back in those days, because it seems like such a long time ago now, I had subscribed to a, um, an, what I guess was one of the earliest podcasts, um, but it was these CDs that I used to receive in the mail. So once a month I would get a CD from the States from a guy called Jeffrey Bland, who is considered to be the godfather of functional medicine the grandfather of functional medicine as he refers to himself now but um and just by coincidence at that time he did one on gluten mm -hmm. so he 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 um interviewed two women and one of them was alice bast who um who co who started a charity a massive charity in the states around celiac disease awareness and i can't even remember who the second one was i listened to this cd and immediately understood, okay, I'm going to have to go to the States to find somebody who knows what, who knows what they're talking about. And I think maybe I need to also study functional medicine myself. So that was 2010, 2011. I started flying to the States to study with the Institute for Functional Medicine. <laughs> Uh, because what they were talking about was the extra intestinal manifestations of celiac disease. So how celiac disease affects the body outside the gut. And that was what was totally missing from everybody's understanding. I never had gastrointestinal symptoms. You know, the joke in my family was that I had this cast iron stomach. I didn't get cast sick. I ate everything and anything. Nothing ever upset my gut. I didn't have any of the diarrhea or constipation or bloating or zero gut symptoms at all. I only had neurological and skin and immune symptoms. And because of that, it didn't get diagnosed for such a long time. And because of that, nobody really understood what to do when something went wrong because celiac disease is an autoimmune disease and autoimmunity is a disease of the immune system, right? It's a, it's a deranged response of the immune system. So your gut in celiac disease, your gut has a problem, but your gut is not the problem, you know, with autoimmunity, or, and this can be true for thyroid disease, for Hashimoto's, for example, or for celiac disease, it's a little bit like if you saw a very angry man kicking a puppy in the street, you know, that puppy has a problem, but that puppy is not the problem. And until you do something about the angry man, which is your immune system, um, then you can give that puppy all of the perfect food you want, but it's can, going to continue to have a problem until you remove the angry man that's kicking it. So that's really what autoimmunity is. It's a problem with your immune system. And nobody had ever, I didn't understand it, and I hadn't done the work of correcting the systemic immune issues that I had. So from that experience and from basically healing myself and then starting to study more, 
I started reaching out in the UK here online to the different celiac forums and chat rooms and things like that. And what I realized was that there was this massive community of people who were really pretty sick, um, who had had a diagnosis, who had gone gluten free, who were really strict with the gluten free diet, who only ate gluten free foods, but gluten free supermarket foods, you know, gluten free breads and you know gluten-free pies and cakes and biscuits and you know which are just chock full of hydrogenated fats and you know revolting sugars and sweeteners and I mean they're gross the ingredients in the gluten-free foods on the supermarket and and um who hadn't addressed any other inflammatory reactions to foods who hadn't addressed the immune system issues who hadn't addressed addressed inflammation in their body and who were still suffering as a result of that so I started reaching out to them and that kind of expanded into working with people with autoimmune disease in general, not just people with celiac disease. And then, um, then I started finding that I was having people presenting in the clinic who couldn't get a diagnosis at all, right? They had this constellation of symptoms, but they didn't meet any of the diagnostic criteria for any of the usual things that, you know, so they might have a, a, a diagnosis of something like IBS or fibromyalgia, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a label that doctors, mm -hmm. exactly. It's a label that doctors reach for when they don't have a real answer. And again, when you have a diagnosis that in conventional medicine, that's the end of the road. Once you've got a diagnosis, then the two tools that conventional medicine have in their tool basket is a drug or a surgery. So once you've got a diagnosis, then the doctor will know which drug or which surgery is appropriate for you. And that's the path that you go down. It's kind of disease management. Um, with functional medicine, the diagnosis, you don't, first of all, you don't need a diagnosis in order to start working towards getting better. And secondly, the diagnosis tells you about the symptoms and that's, it's the beginning of the process, um, not the end of the process. So, so I, so then I started working with kind of complex cases and people who couldn't get a diagnosis and working backwards from there. So that's essentially how my business evolved. And, um, that's kind of it really. I, <laughs> um, then had a couple of kids into the mix. <laughs> so I had to sort of start to think a bit creatively about how to run a business and be a mum and do all of that kind of stuff all at the same time, which, the answer to that is I work from home and I consult via Skype and Zoom and I do sort of distance consulting instead of um, in clinic face-to-face -face consulting. And I found that that was actually very good for the business because my patient population is people who are too sick to travel, mm -hmm. or who are quite far flung. You know, I can sit here in Seven Oaks and do a consultation with somebody in the Outer Hebrides if I need to, or in Holland or, you know, France or... Australia <laughs> it's a wonderful it's it's a wonderful yeah. time you know um for mm. sick people like you and I to to be able mm. to you know and it's funny you were talking about the cds that's like a full, fully relic pre-podcast day they get <laughs> in the post you know it's like hilarious I know it's hilarious but you know like now we're so lucky that we have all this information available we've got these chat groups and these your know, Facebook groups where we can find other people and we can realize mm. we're not going crazy we're not dying of cancer there is something wrong with us but we're not on our own and we can do something to reclaim our health just like you've done Robin and what I'd like to find out a bit more is um what did you actually do to heal yourself I know we've we've already dis dismissed the gluten-free Doritos as a as a healthy option to go the GF route yeah. but what did you personally do to really um to heal your to heal yourself so two of the most important things that I personally did was um, I identified other food reactions that I was having. And that was a really, so the, the, I guess I did four things for myself at that time. So I identified other food reactions. So I was having a really, really big and a really big inflammatory reactions to egg at that time. And it was actually eggs and corn and I think tapioca, which is a, it's a actually fairly common ingredient in um, gluten-free foods. Uh, but eggs uh, were something that because they're nutrient dense and they're, you know, kind of a nutritional superfood, I was eating eggs and I was exercising a lot at that time. I was eating at least two eggs almost every day. You know, I would throw a boiled egg into my handbag if I was going shopping so that I had a little portable snack. Um, you know, I really loved eggs and still do. But when I got glutened, one of the things about when you 
when you have a massive inflammatory reaction in the gut like that, especially when it's food triggered by a food, is that you break something called oral tolerance. And oral tolerance is a feature of your immune system that because food is, so the gut is the biggest interface between our environment and our body. Okay. So your gut is actually technically outside the body. Humans are a donut. Okay. We're a solid core. I mean, we're a solid entity, but with this hole running through the middle. So the, even though you've taken it in, it actually hasn't been absorbed into your body yet. So the, the gut mucosa, that gut wall is this interface between our environment and the biggest foreign protein that we take in on a daily basis is of course our food. So you have to have a mechanism to decide that you're not going to react to food because food is not self, but it's also not dangerous. But when you're having reactions to food, you've broken this oral tolerance mechanism. So, and when, so when I get glutened, and this happens pretty much every time, when I get glutened, I lose tolerance. And during that period of lost tolerance, I develop a new food reaction. So in that, and I didn't know that that was part of my, um, didn't even know that that was a thing to start with. And I didn't know that that was part of my pattern. So when I got glutened really badly, that time I started um, reacting to eggs. And eggs are one of the top eight allergens and they provoke a severe inflammatory reaction in me. So I did some testing. I identified other food problems outside of gluten, which is something that doesn't happen enough in celiac disease, so that extra testing. Second thing I did was actually um, comprehensive blood chemistry. So I looked to see what was going on in my body from a basic biochemical sense that needed correcting. Um, and discovered that I had anemia and vitamin D deficiency. Okay, so two super important things around immune regulation and energy production and brain function. So corrected those. And uh, I actually, I mean, this is not ultimately necessary, but one of the things that I did was I did a genetic screen, genetic... Um, uh, Genetic testing was super new in the UK at that time. And I, so I did the first course that was available here and discovered that my detoxification genes are rotten. Right? I've got lots of really bad. I've got lots of um, polymorphisms in the genes that are involved in eliminating trash from the body. And I'm missing a couple of genes that are involved in making glutathione. So my ability, basic ability to take out the trash is poor. And beauty therapy is actually a super toxic industry believe it or not i was you know absorbing absorbing solvents and plastics and all kinds of really awful things into my system for years 10 years and not able to take out the trash appropriately so that had all uh, accumulated in my system and it made me really sensitive to other toxic exposures and when um so one of the things that people don't necessarily understand about food is that food is also a toxin. It's an allergen, it's a toxin, it's a medicine, you know, it's lots of good things and some bad things as well. So when you have issues in the gut, when you've got celiac disease and you're having gluten reactions, you're fermenting food, you're making alcohols and things like um, cadaverine and putrescine and all of these like fantastic microbial toxins and food toxins in the gut. And, and that totally crashed my body out because at that time the snow, you know, it's this, uh, the camel, you know, the final straw. So I'd been accumulating all of this stuff for all of that time. And then that final exposure plus the inflammatory reactions to foods, plus the, you know, um, anemia and things like that, it had all kind of accumulated to, to take the rug out from under my feet. So identifying that that was a problem and supporting my liver and supporting detoxification and supporting elimination from my body of things was a, a really big part of, um, of that for me as well so that's what I did but of course foundational to all of that was food you know I had to make sure that I was eating the right kinds of foods but also eating enough um, because just eating veggies and eating your I don't know what it is in Australia but over here it's five a day so the recommendation from the government is to eat five servings of fruit and veg a day and one of those can be apple juice if you want it to be right so totally inadequate um you know so for me really because my history is so long it's more like 10 to 15 servings of veg per day 
without any, you know, that's just the veg. So making sure that I was eating enough that my body had the tools that it needed to repair and recover. And then of course I was also using some nutritional supplements, vitamin D, glutamine. Glutamine was a big one for me because it helps, it helps repair muscle. It helps to repair the gut. It helps to create energy. So that was very, very helpful for me at that time. I can't remember what else I was taking. It's, I take a lot of stuff. You can probably see I've got lots of little bottles on the shelf behind me. So I dip in and out as I need to, but um, that was, that was how I healed. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Very inspiring. And can you just give us a bit of an idea about um, when you talk about inflammatory response to food, what does that look like? Can you give us some of the symptoms? So people are thinking, mm, how would I know if I was allergic to eggs? Are there any kind of like telltale signs that people can look out for? Yes. So, so first of all, there is th three primary ways that food can be inflammatory, right? So you can be having an antibody reaction um, where the reaction is specific. Uh, so, for example, when I eat gluten or when I eat eggs, I make a very high volume of antibodies. And an antibody is a flag that tells your immune system to attack. So it's a specific response. You can be, a food can be generally pro-inflammatory. Right? So a food can trigger pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body, and that's non-specific. Right? So um, casein, for example, the, the protein found in dairy is generally pro-inflammatory. Sugar is generally pro-inflammatory. So if you're already inflamed, eating an inflammatory but damaged fats, like the cheap, nasty vegetable oils and things are pro-inflammatory. So if you're already inflamed, you can be throwing fuel on the fire with those kind of inflammatory foods. And you will probably have very similar symptoms to uh, if you're having an antibody reaction because inflammation is still inflammation and you will be reacting in a way that's specific to you because you have a weak link in your chain, right, where your susceptibility is. Or food can be fermenting in the gut and creating inflammatory reactions. Um, well, actually, so food will be uh, metabolized by the bacteria and the bacteria create inflammatory reactions. So... Inflammatory reactions then would be pretty much anything, pretty much anything actually. So any kind of inflammation. So, but common things include, so fatigue is probably the number one. Um, if you've got unexplained fatigue, you definitely need to consider inflammatory reactions to food, starting with antibody testing. Uh, any kind of skin problem, so acne, eczema. So eczema, for example, or psoriasis, very, very um, involved with food reactions. So very specifically with eczema, it's wheat, dairy, and eggs. Um, and somebody actually said they should call it eczema because um, it's so common to be reacting to eggs when you have eczema. And then in kids, um, reflux. Uh, any of that sort of colic, unexplained crying, eczema again, um, uh, any kind of um, sensory processing disorder is probably related to foods or has food as, as part of the inflammatory um, uh, issues with, with kids. Yeah. But kind of anything, migraines, um, any autoimmune issues. I don't know. The, the list is long. The list goes on and on. <laughs> goes on, and on. The list is long. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And, and specific to each person. So for the antibody mm. testing, would that be like an IgG test, something like that? If somebody wanted so, to. So yes, that's probably the common one. Um, IgG testing is a bit of a minefield um, because from company to company, there's not a lot of regulation. Um, but that is the probably the most easily available one for most people. And I would say, if it's possible, try to get IgG and complement, because um, when complement is included in the test, it's taking it that step further and identifying that IgG is actually triggering the food reaction or the inflammatory reaction. Um, and there's a, there is a company that also does IgG and IgA testing called Cyrex. Um, a bit difficult to get hold of in Australia, but uh, hopefully that will change fairly soon. I was talking to the, I was at an autoimmune conference talking to the CEO and asking if it was going to be in Australia anytime soon. And he's open, like he says that that's the next frontier. So if you're autoimmune, that's the one to choose because you need to know the IgA reactions mm -hmm. with autoimmunity. But if you're not autoimmune, then IgG would serve you definitely. And that's where I started. When I when I was sick in 2010, that's what I did was just a really simple available to the public IgG panel. And I, you know, I had a few things that were 
low level, but the ones that were sky high were the ones that really problematic for me. So, yeah. So Robin, can you define for us functional medicine? Like, what is it? It's like, you know, it's a buzzword. We all talk about it. And, you know, if we're not getting uh, the results that we want from our standard GP, then we need to go and see an integrated functional medicine doctor. What does that actually mean? Like, what does, what does it involve? Okay, so sure, functional medicine at its core is just a really different way of thinking about um, health and disease, like what is health and what is disease. So, um, and so primarily the definition of health from a functional medicine perspective is that it's, an, it's a state of abundant, um, uh, optimal physiological function. It's not just the absence of a diagnosable disease, which is kind of the conventional medicine perspective on it. So it's a dynamic process in the body. Um, but really functional medicine is systems biology thinking so it's working backwards from the problem and the symptom that you have to understand what's upstream like why is that happening and but not just that because that's integrative medicine that's nutritional therapy right it's also understanding how um how the interconnected web of your body works. So when you, so for example, if you have a problem with your gut, is that problem actually starting in your brain? Um, and if you have a problem with your gut, how does that affect your brain? And so if you're presenting with brain symptoms, is that actually a problem with your gut? Um, so there's, you know, it kind of borrows from anything that works essentially. So some naturopathic medicine thinking and, um, uh, you know, conventional medicine, anything that works in pretty much any modality will be borrowed um, in order to help somebody get well. The other thing that I think is really brilliant about functional medicine is that it um, usually tries to, so there's a big focus on understanding systems-based thinking. So you know where to make an intervention that will get you the most bang for your buck, right? So instead of, um, so if you've got problems with your liver and problems with fatigue and problems with swelling in your ankles and you're getting migraines and, you know, you've kind of got things that are symptoms that spread out all over your body and all through different organ systems, understanding instead of giving you a, um, a nutritional or a naturopathic or, a, you know, a green um, um, solution for each of your symptoms, it's actually working back from all of them to understand where they intercept. And when they, so you can intervene there. So you make the single intervention that has the biggest impact on the most areas of the body. Um, lost my train of thought. So uh, the other thing though is also understanding not just the physical, um, the biochemistry. So also understanding we might need to look at the relationships in your life. You know, looking at your relationship to your work, looking at do you have a spiritual practice or not. Um, and if you did have a spiritual practice before and something went wrong with that and that's a thing that's missing from your life, then that's actually going to be having an impact on your immune system. So it's kind of looking at other things, relationships and physical activity and how everything um, comes together to create health in a person and, um, and addressing each of those things, not just the one where you have a symptom. So it's not like functional medicine is really different than a lot of people think, I think, because it's not just about understanding that there's, there might be a more natural way to address the problem that you have, right? So if you've got high cholesterol, instead of taking a statin, you can take red yeast rice, red rice yeast. I can never get that the right way around, but, um, that's green that's basically green medicine right so you've given a natural alternative yes you're not taking a drug yes it's probably effective yes but it's that's not functional medicine um that's green medicine um functional medicine is asking why is your cholesterol high in the first place and is it actually high because you're stressed or is it high because your blood sugar is imbalanced is it high because you're doing too much physical activity um uh, is it high because you have mold in your home, right? What is the reason that that's high in the first place? And uh, let's see if we can try to bring it down by addressing the actual cause, not just by giving you a natural alternative to a drug. It's kind of long-winded, I guess. That's a very good description. No, that's, uh, I really like that. You've described that really, really well. And I think that, you know, it's, it's completely the opposite to what your 
uh, clients were coming to for you in the beauty therapy days when you know you said they just wanted that quick fix anything functional medicine is it's going to be a journey it's not like you're going to go and see a functional medicine practitioner and they're going to heal you in one session you know it's going to take a lot of unpacking and assessing and and moving forward so i think when when any of us come to look at this healing journey we need to really be thinking of it in terms of the rest of our lives or at least two to five years to to be um, making change to see things happen do you have any um case studies from your clients obviously don't mention any names that you would particularly (laughs) like to share with us today Sure. That's a great question. So one of my, um, probably one of the first one that's, that springs to mind is a, is a case. I've got lots, um, you know, my clients have been, my patients have been the, the place where I've learned the most. It's the, it's medical school in practice kind of thing, you know? So I've got tons of really interesting cases. And one of the best things about working with complex cases is that my, the stories that they tell me are fascinating. You know, their health journey is fascinating and inspiring. Um, so I've, I have lots, but there is one specifically who I've taught a couple of times. It's actually the, um, the one that I presented when I was 40 weeks pregnant, but um, you know, her, her story wasn't finished at that time, but it would come far enough forward for me to start talking about it. And she doesn't mind if I talk about her. So, um, so her name's Zoe. I can mention her by name. Um, she was, 16 when I started working with her she's I think 19 now and uh when she so when she ended up in my clinic slash on my Skype um she had been sick she'd been sick for three years so when she was 13 she had been at school and she was running around playing hockey as um as part of um phys ed Mm. and she'd fought tripped over and on the way down she'd hit her head on the hip bone of one of her classmates and she she actually got a concussion but that wasn't diagnosed at that time so she went down she hit her head pretty hard and she got up really wobbly white as a sheet not not doing well but she didn't actually pass out and because she didn't pass out they didn't send her to the nurse so she just sat on the side for the rest of the class and then her class after phys ed was music and uh, so she'd been playing the flute since she was very young. So she was, she's pretty accomplished as a, as a flutist. Um, and it was her flute teacher who sort of fairly quickly, and the music teacher that fairly quickly identified that there was a problem because she couldn't play the flute in the way that she normally was able to. So the flute, the music teacher sent her to the nurse. And again, they didn't actually do anything. They just kept her in the... Um, in the infirmary for the rest of the day. And then when her mom came to pick her up, she came walking out of the school. They had phoned her to say that this thing had happened, but she, um, she was okay. When she came walking out of the school, her mother was like, that's not my daughter. I don't know what happened to her, but she's, there's something wrong. You know, she was white as a sheet. She was shaking. She was very clearly unwell. She had a headache for a few days. Um, and that started going down the rabbit hole of um, she, she's actually never been well since that moment, or she had never been well since that moment. So um, she started getting headaches. The headaches were pretty severe. Um, she started getting t- fatigue, basically. And um, she was eventually diagnosed with post concussion syndrome. And she was sent to an energy management clinic who taught her how to budget her energy and how to build it up um, uh, in gradual increments over the day so that she could increase her um, uh, capacity for energy. And she did, and she did pretty well. It took a little while, but she worked pretty hard at it and did eventually go back to school. I was doing okay. She wasn't great, but she was functioning and her family were kind of okay with that. And, um, and then she, out of the blue one day, threw up. So she basically had a stomach flu and um, that, which is a normal thing, you know, we all get bugs that go around from time to time. And it was just that it wasn't food poisoning or anything. It was just a stomach flu, but that kicked her into um a total complete relapse. So she lost all of the progress that she'd made working with the energy management clinic. And now she had pain. So that was about 12 to 18 months after the original incident. So I met her about another 18 months after that, two years to 18 months after that. And at that time she was um, unable to get out of bed. She wasn't going to school. She was 
aiming for 10 minutes out of bed per day. So on a good day, she might play the flute for 10 minutes or five minutes, or she would have a shower. She couldn't do both. Um, she couldn't stand up. She was in so much pain in her gut that she couldn't stand up properly. And she would have several episodes per day of acute pain where she got this kind of sharp stabbing pain in the abdomen that would have her shaking, crying, lying on the floor, white as a ghost, um, feeling like she was burning up, but with no actual change in uh, tangible temperature, the, the fatigue, unable to like altered brain function because she was so tired. She couldn't really talk. Um, you know, her mother was beside herself and she'd had every possible medical investigation that you can imagine. They'd ruled out any kind of brain trauma. They'd ruled out any kind of disease in the gut. Nobody could work out what was going on with her. So, and she was taking a ton of medication. So she was taking um, two of everything. So she was taking two over-the-counter pain meds. She was taking two prescription pain meds. Um, she was, because the pain meds made her severely um, nauseated, uh, she was taking two antiemetics and she was also taking two um, uh, laxatives. Uh, and even with taking the two laxatives at, at maximum dose multiple times uh, she was only moving her bowels once a week or so right? just no movement there whatsoever so my thinking went like this okay this clearly started from that head injury so let's look at that what might that have had an effect so head injury concussion equals neurological inflammation neurological inflammation can damage the vagus nerve which travels from the brain to the gut um, so it's very possible that when she got that original injury, that her, the signals traveling from her brain to her gut slowed down and were now kind of ineffective. And the impact that that would have is reduced digestion. Her, she wouldn't have been making stomach acid appropriately. She wouldn't have been making uh, digestive enzymes appropriately and might probably, so she, when you don't digest your food, it ferments and it kind of putrefies in the gut. Most importantly, your vagus nerve controls movements, you know, muscle contractions um, and movement of the gut and the bacteria through the digestive tract. So if you're not doing that, then it doesn't move along and it sits there and it ferments and you, you change your microbial ecology in the gut and you start making all of these toxins, some of which are mitochondrial toxins, which contribute to fatigue, some of which are alcohols, which create a hangover without the party. You know, there's a ton of stuff that your gut can make in an unhealthy situation like that. And in her case, I think that that's what happened. I think that's, you know, we did some testing. We kind of confirmed she had raging SIBO. She wasn't moving her gut at all. Um, you know, she had a lot of, we did gut testing um, and some nutrient testing and things like that, blood chemistry, but that was the focus. And also understanding that in order for that to happen, before she got the head in injury in the first place, she already had symptoms of there being problems with her gut. So she had um, seasonal allergies and she didn't have, you know, her mum, who's a fantastic woman and who prepares food was none, you know, she was eating things like a salami and cheese sandwich on a baguette for lunch and she'd have a croissant for breakfast and they would have a kind of chicken and veg type meal for dinner. But a lot of what she was eating was wheat and dairy and processed and, you know, chips and snacks and fast food and McDonald's when she went out with her friends and, you know, her diet was a contributing factor for sure. And she already had symptoms of dysbiosis of problems with the bacteria in the gut. So she had that preceding issue that when you add the head injury onto it, um, cre like created a, um, what do you want to call that? Like a, a, an accident waiting to happen essentially. Right. So then she had, so layered on top of the head injury, she had, um, <clears throat> laid on top of those two things and but she functioned right it wasn't enough to tip her right over the edge she had reduced function she had fatigue she had inflammation in her body but it wasn't the thing that kicked her over um but it was a, a powder what's that word it's like a keg of powder basically waiting for the spark gun. so when she got that barrel gunpowder barrel. Yeah. Yeah. a barrel of a barrel of gunpowder basically an accident waiting to happen so the trigger the final nail in her no, not nailing her coffin. That's a terrible analogy to use in this situation. But the um, the the straw that broke the camel's back for her That's finally was this was 
the gut bug. Yeah. You know, so a simple bug that went around the school was the thing that tipped her right over the edge because her body couldn't cope with anything else. And once she, once she had that essentially infection in the gut, everything else just spilled over. So her gut was poisoning her body. Um, so we changed everything about her diet. We, I started giving her exercises to do that helped to strengthen the vagus nerve by um, activating the brain. Um, we used vitamin C to create an osmotic laxative to flush all of that um, basically compacted feces and microbial toxins. Um, just to get it out of the body. And, you know, it's not like a colonic irrigation, which only works on the bowel. We had to flush her entire, her problems were actually in the small intestine. We had to flush her entire system. So we used vitamin C to do that. Um, she did juicing. We, we had to support everything about her liver. We had to support her gallbladder because that was all totally disordered from the head injury. And we had to work on the brain because we, once we kind of cleared the gut out a little bit, we'd come as far as we could with the gut and we had to start rehabilitating the brain for her. Um, so we did that. She took nutritional supplements. We um, tested her mitochondria. We supported her ability to make energy. And um, I barely see her anymore, but um, the end result of all of that is she's on a pretty strict diet. She's, um, you know, she doesn't tolerate like sugars and carbohydrate foods particularly well. So she is on an extremely high veg diet and she's at university now. So she's juicing and preparing all of her foods herself. She doesn't live the normal um, university life, right? She doesn't drink alcohol. She does drink green juice. Um, uh, but she she got all A stars in her exams. Um, she's studying biochemistry at King's College, which is a really good college here in London, in London Bridge. And um, she is the captain of her water polo team. She's travelled around Germany with her choir, playing the flute. You know, like life is totally different for her. Um, the trajectory is totally different. And we did all of that without a diagnosis. You know, she was undiagnosable. There's never been anything that we followed the lead of to explain um, any of her symptoms, except that it was the function of her body wasn't working anymore. So that is functional medicine. We worked out what needed to be removed because it was getting in the way of of her body functioning, what needed to be replaced because it was needed for function and what needed to, what tissues needed to be repaired and rehabilitated, how to re-inoculate her guts and how to rebalance her entire system um, so that she could be well. And that's, I mean... Go Zoe! I love that story! Medicine. Go Zoe! <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that story with us because that's just, wow, I was like you know, on the edge of my seat, like, then what, then what, and then what happened? <laughs> And you know, I think so many of us can relate to having, you know, some of the precursor symptoms that Zoe had, you know, in the beginning where she, you know, seasonal allergies, I'm thinking, you know, you know like we've, we've all had certain things and then, you know, maybe we've gone a bit further in our decades than Zoe did before everything came crashing down. Um, but it's a wonderful story to hear that no matter what happens, even if you're in bed, completely riddled with pain and you're shaking and you can only get out of bed for five minutes a day to either... A, play the flute or B, have a shower, you couldn't possibly do both, to then go on. So Zoe, if you're listening, hopefully Robin will share this because you're famous in Australia now uh, <laughs> and the world. <laughs> well done, Zoe. What an inspiration you are and I hope that you do really well at college and you go on to inspire other people to, um, to do amazing things as well. Thank you for that. that and actually, share. That's good. yeah, but... but Another thing that's important to understand about Zoe is it was her family, right? So her family did this with her. Um, you know, her mom was a superstar. Um, and in the beginning when Zoe was so exhausted, was chopping veggies and washing the juicer multiple times a day and doing, you know, so Zoe and her family did it together. And I think that that's actually very important because of course the support and the, and the relationships there was the message, you can do this, we've got you, you know, um, as opposed to it being a targeted therapy of only, only Zoe and you're sick and we're going to, you know, we're fix you kind of thing. Mm. So there's a, there's a whole nother branch of things that I could talk about. <laughs> the whole of podcast, working with man. families when one of the kids, yeah. yeah. Working with families when one of the kids has a problem. Mm. But yeah, Zoe, you are a champion. I am going to send this to you. So you are now famous in Australia, love. You are. <laughs> well done. Zoe as well as the UK. As well as the UK and the world. Awesome, awesome. Now we're on time, Robin, but before you go, 
Rachel, I couldn't possibly let you leave without finding out what your opinion, your personal opinion is on chocolate, wine and coffee. So chocolate is my food kryptonite. It's a total food with no breaks for me. So I'm a big love affair with chocolate. Um, uh, yeah, that's my opinion. Heart, all the heart eyes. Um, wine. Um, so wine in moderation is actually my thing. You know, alcohol can do some good things in the body. It's very fun socially. I actually don't drink particularly myself, although I do love a glass of champagne at New Year and on my birthday. So wine, it's all about context. Coffee, I can't cope with coffee personally at all. So coffee makes me feel like I'm going to die from anxiety. I don't tolerate caffeine particularly well because of all of those detox genes that I've got problems with. But talk to me about tea. And again, I'm back to all the hard eyes. So coffee's personal. Um, but I love the smell of it, actually. So Yeah, it, it does. It's, it always smells so much better than it actually tastes, unfortunately, yeah. when it comes to coffee. Why, so just smell it. Then you don't, don't have, much, you don't have any... Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you just have those coffee bean, little pots of coffee beans around the house. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> now, Robin, if people are listening to you and they're like, oh, my God, I want to work with Robin. I know she does Zoom calls, Skype calls across the world. How can they get in touch? So I have a website, which is www.robinpuglia.com. And Puglia is spelt P-U-G-L-I-A, Robin with a Y. Um, that's probably the best place. But actually, I'm super active on Instagram. And I really love interacting with people on Instagram because um, it's, it's actually a place where I share photos of my kids and, you know, photos of my meals. It's actually, it's the most personal interaction with me that you can have online. Um, and I like connecting with people there. So do follow me on Instagram, drop me a line and say hello. And if you make a positive comment about one of my kids, I'll love you forever. Um, uh, I do have a Facebook page where I, where I share articles that I've written and, um, you know, things that are more interesting sort of in sound bites from a work perspective, from a health perspective, etc. So those are definitely the places to start. Awesome. Robin, we'll put those in the show notes for everybody to be able to come and find you. And thank you so much for your time today and being on the show. Pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. And um, hello to all the Primalistas out there. Keep up the good work, you guys. <laughs> <laughs>